Hello, welcome to the London Central Asia Research Network Larkarn Book Talk. Professor Pamela Kyle Crossley from Dartmouth University will talk about her brilliant book, Hammer and Anvil, Nomad Rulers at the Forge of the Modern World, published by Roman and Littlefield in 2019. I'm Gülberna Özcan, and I will be moderating this event. My research is on Central Asian uh, enterprise development, uh, in particular uh, five countries, post-Soviet states, and I'm one of the co-founders of Lakan. This is an interdisciplinary platform for doctoral and postdoctoral researchers working on Central Asia and its wider region, and was first established in 2011. So please visit our webpage and follow us on Twitter. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Crossley, an eminent scholar on the Qing Empire and modern Chinese history. She also researches and writes on Central and Inner Asian history, global history, the history of Western in Eurasia before the modern period, and the imperial sources of modern identities. She is the author of eight books. In particular, her research on the Qing history using Manchu sources and others has been so influential that it received much hostile reception from nationalist scholars in China, as you can see in her Wikipedia page. As an amateur reader of inner history, I learned a great deal about the crucial place of Central Asia or Inner Asia and the early Turkic Mongol rulership from her work. Professor Crossley's analysis offers deep insight and imagination that you would not have picked up from historians who do not or cannot combine the breadth of historical vision about the entirety of Eurasia with an original analysis about the relationships among not just leaders and their peoples, but also about spiritual, ethical, and epistemological positions behind legitimacy of rulers. Her analysis is lucid in demonstrating how ideas have been transmitted throughout the region. This is evident in her analyses on a range of issues from the influences of horse breeding on managing organizations to the celestial sources of rulership. The book opens with a series of insights into the poorly understood centuries of nomadism in Central Asia and Inner Asia and reminds us that since history is written by the victors most scholars focus too much on the significance of European intellectual traditions on the one side and the view from Beijing on the other. To give you a taste of her approach, let me read a short passage that follows her discussion of Machiavelli and the popularity of Il Principe, the prince, in the Muslim world and beyond. Now the quote. This representational curtain parting Europe from Asia did not fall all of a sudden. European historical terminology back to Herodotus and perhaps earlier when Greek writers marked off Anatolia and Iran from their own world, referred to the land to the east as Asia. West-East dichotomies remained established in many European traditions, but with unstable denotations. Over time, demarcations of fundamental religion were draped over the framework and even economy and society. The West became by early modern times a place of no eunuchs, no slavery in theory, and no nomads. East Asian rulers before the late 16th century tended to see a horizonless, all under heaven 
of neighbors, strangers, and enemies. Incidentally, but not irremediably, separated by differences of language, culture, and economic life. Now, I would like to welcome Professor Crossley to deliver her talk. Then we will have a question and answer session. Please write your comments and questions in the chat box. Over to you, Professor Crossley. Thank you. And, and I just, this is a very, very big thank you. I, uh, Professor Ustan just contacted me out of the blue, having read the book, said so many kind things about it and has been very, very kind in uh, arranging the particulars of this visit. So I'm, I'm really pleased and honored to do this. And uh, I really am so pleased that you ended your remarks with the quotes about Machiavelli. I, I, I really, um, uh, when I came to see Machiavelli in the context I was creating there, it was quite a revelation to me. Um, but not originally, because I discovered that only recently had been published this wonderful book of essays about Machiavelli in exactly the same kind of Eurasian context, um, which was then very important to me in understanding him. So I think we, we have quite a bit of revision to do in terms of the way that we are understanding our own uh, intellectual foundations, uh, you know, at least of the modern world. Um, and um, I am really, I think, the closest way to describe my own um, um, specialization is probably intellectual history. So one of the preoccupations I had in this book, um, it, well, let's say, it's difficult to say what the book is about, even though it, it's clear enough, but it's very difficult to just brought, bring it into a few words. But let's reason backwards, right? In fact, let's say from Machiavelli backwards, what is it I was trying to get at? I was sort of thinking that um, there are really, uh, in the context of Eurasia, there were two uh, great trends that I saw as as critical to creating this, this uh, threshold of, of the modern world, the early modern world. And um, the first of them was the emergence of states that had as a fundamental mechanism the objectification of uh, identities um, with a racial base or with a cultural base but the objectification of these identities as a state process and in fact a very fundamental state process and um, uh, and then the second thing that i was interested in was the origins of skeptical inquiry in the late medieval and early modern world and what I came to feel as I was was that these two are connected, and the connection between them is the um, development of certain um, political concepts and habits in the Central Asian tradition that then uh, were, came to a period where they're imposed imposed upon these very populous, very wealthy societies, basically at the margins of Eurasia. Um, and that in that process of the rule of these post-nomadic uh, rulers over these very populous sedentary societies, um, that they link together these trends that I thought were most critical in understanding the early modern world. This. Um, political objectification of identities, personal identities on the one hand, and then this uh, emergence of skeptical inquiry. Um, the, the book itself, um, it, I started it 30 years ago and it was very different. It was going to be about the societies that were peripheral to the Mongol conquest. So uh, let's say Japan and Vietnam and Thailand and Lithuania and Poland and the, the Mamluk um, Empire, um, to look at how uh, they changed in the period of the wars against the Mongols and the Mongol occupations of these more central central regions of, of Eurasia. Um, and uh, I was pretty interested in that, although 
that the first stage when I came to realize that the changes in the tangential areas are really very similar to what happened in the central areas. You, you can hear my dogs in there. Um, uh, and so for that reason, it looked like it's actually not a separate story. It, it's really part of this continental story. So then in having to confront the continent, well, that then led to another thing. So then I would drop it and then I would go back to it and I would go drop it and go back to it and so on. And in the meantime, of course, I got involved in several of these projects relating to the so-called global history. And I was really struck with a habit that people had in, in global history of emphasizing what they call encounter and exchange. So it's like it's all happening on the surface and uh, I'm traveling across Asia and I kind of encounter you somewhere in the middle, let's say Sindh, right? Sort of modern day Pakistan. And I tell you about glass and then you tell me about silk and then you know everybody's encountering and exchanging until we meet some critical mass right and then all of a sudden poof we launch into the early modern period i wasn't completely happy with this sort of template um because my feeling was and again originally my my perspective is from intellectual history that it isn't these encounters and exchanges that there are actually these kind of at one point in the book, I call them organic. It, it's, it's not so good, I mean, but but you see what I mean. These integrated, continental-wide changes that were producing um, these important trends, particularly this this turn towards materialism in the in in um, in uh, philosophy and the sort of 15th, 16th centuries that happens in China, that happens in Europe, it also uh, happens in a way in the in the Islamic world, um, that it wasn't on the surface, that there was something, you know, in the broadly shared um, material qualities, probably in the terrains, right, of Eurasia that was actually producing this. So then that was a, that was a difficult thing. And that is then what I pursued. And um, uh, the real problem, it turned out in the end, was trying to get it to fit into the number of words that you're allowed to use to do a book. So um, it is 160,000 words as it is, and 100,000 words were cut out. And I just today, in looking at chapter nine, I realized these cuts are actually not very well done. It's just sort of choppy and all over. But um, uh, this is. Uh, um, so it turned out to be this very, very big, very broad, very complicated thing. And the greatest challenge of all was just trying to squeeze it down into this few number of words. Um, so as a consequence, the, the maps are only the size of playing cards and you know, there was very, various kinds of uh, sort of frustra frustrating sides to it. But um, I think, particularly when I hear from somebody like you, right, that um, somehow it does go right from the beginning to the end through the middle and it may be possible to actually see what is going on um machiavelli really is very central to me in terms of understanding how this story how the story ends right because i think it's after machiavelli that we have this you know along come these people like montagne and montesquieu who are really using this this prefabricated concept of the east as a kind of foil to talk about what's happening in Europe. It's available to them, right, in a way that I really don't think it was to Machiavelli. Um, his understanding of the Ottomans was that they are right in line with things that go back to the Roman Empire. In fact, they, they may be the most authentic representatives in some ways of the, uh, the great imperial traditions. I think it's after Machiavelli that that's, that kind of thinking just isn't available to us anymore. And yet we think that Machiavelli is somehow the author of the way we think now, when, when I, I actually think he was probably thinking in a totally different way. So um, that's, that's more or less the overall schematic of the book. Um, there's a couple of points I should make, particularly for people who haven't um, read the book. Um, it, it isn't, a lot of it, it's not about nomadism. I was, it's really, so there's, at the beginning, I sort of talk about nomadism as a concept, and then it, it sort of disappears. We, we don't have a lot of nomadism as we're going through the book. Um, uh, 
except in the discussion of how nomadism shaped these political traditions that later become, well, these institutions and practices that later become so important in the um, uh, emergence of these early modern state forms in China, in uh, the Ottoman Empire, um, Timurids, and, 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 and so on. So nomadism is, um, in the title, you know, there's an emphasis on economy, so we kind of said nomad. It really is, should have been something like post-nomadic rulers, but um, nomadic is still appropriate because it's really the nomadic part of the tradition that is what remains important. Um, and um, the other thing is the way that I talk about Turks, right? Um, uh, Turks are Turks in the book, but some other people are also Turks. And this is something I sort of stole from um, Muslim historiography, that there is a kind of historical role that is assigned to the Turks. And you can find this role, whether you're looking at China or you're looking at Greece or you're looking at the Byzantine Empire, you can, you can find this role uh, being fulfilled by various peoples, most of whom are actually Turks. Um, but um, I don't have, you know, there's lots of very wonderful uh, histories of the Turkic peoples. I'm not trying to contribute one of those. I'm trying to talk about this historical role. And I think I'm kind of trying to get at things that uh, maybe are not always covered in histories of the Turkic peoples. Um, but I am delighted to say the first translation of the book into a foreign language will be into Turkish. Uh, so we'll see how, how that goes. So I wanted, to, I just, because the book is difficult to answer, I just wanted to kind of lay out these broad sort of issues and then maybe see where people want to take us now. Is that, you think that's okay? But... Yes, certainly. Uh, thank you. Indeed, it is uh, not an easy book to read <laughs> because it's extremely rich and it has lots of ideas. So uh, perhaps I can ask uh, our participants uh, to raise comments or questions. I'll moderate them if you allow me. So uh, yes, please, you can write your questions um, in the chat box. Uh, and in the meantime, perhaps uh, to, to give, allow you a little bit time for thinking, I would uh, then ask a question from your last point about this Turk. Could you tell us a little bit about who is this Turk? <laughs> <laughs> um, huh, okay, well, um, I'm not a specialist in this area. So I, what I could do was to read the scholarship on this. Um, in English and in European languages. I can only read a tiny little bit of, of, of Turkish. Um, but, uh, you know, there's an anthropological perspective, there's a linguistic perspective, right? There's a, you know, um, but um, the Turks, who the Turks are in the book are the kind of oppositional force, the challenging force to the societies that have defined themselves as civilizations. Right. So at some early point, you have China, Greece, and, and you know, um, uh, parts of India, with, uh, Iran, certainly, you know, defining themselves as, well, we're civilizational, and then there's these barbarians. The barbarians are not exclusively nomads from Central Asia, but that's a lot of what the barbarians are about. And so then you have the real history in which, in fact, these previously defined barbarians are overrunning um, these societies and sometimes governing them for a very long time. So over time, you have this question, well, you know, who's really the barbarian here? Now, it's not just the role, right? So I didn't want just this empty abstract role to say these, these are Turks. Um, the specifics of the Turkic political tradition were quite important to me. And in some ways that would come into my definition of who are the Turks. The Turks are the people who have um, uh, consolidated these traditions, let's put it that way. So we, we can't find all the origins of them among peoples we would call Turks, 
historically, let's say we're going to go go back as far as the as the um, the cognates, right, of the of the sixth century. We don't find them inventing all of these institutions, but they consolidate them. They, in some ways, they make them imperial. Um, they give it an ideological uh, sort of structure on top of it that um, allows it to come in later, right, into China, into the Islamic world, into Eastern Europe, and have the effects that it has. So just in terms of this, this idea of keeping religions, uh, established religions, hierarchical religions, sort of at arm's length, um, sort of protecting the, the central religious uh, practices of the imperial lineage, of um, very carefully playing off factions against one another, whether it's in the aristocracy, whether it's in the, in the, among the literate elites, whether it's among the, the religious hierarchies, um, and then especially this, this idea of acknowledging and in fact constructing uh, in terms of law and later in terms of history, uh, these diverse identities that are then become a matter of state ascription. There I saw the most powerful, one of the most powerful developments was the emergence of Turks, uh, uh, not emergence, the, the arrival of Turks in the Islamic world because the Islamic world already had traditions very similar to this or they had something in common and when you put them together right you you get these very powerful sort of processes that look a lot like our modern um institutions of identity ascription and objectification um and then in this with relation to my other great theme which was skeptical inquiry i found that the turkic political traditions were those that were uh, kind of qualifying and attenuating the authority of, of the religious hierarchs, um, leaning a little bit toward the intuitive and dissident schools, whether it's in the Islamic world or it's in the Confucian world or in the Christian world, um, that, that so that the Turks it, historically in, my, in the book are playing this role. Now, I'm actually very interested in the scholarship on the languages and uh, the groupings, you know, all the, these groupings as they appear in the early records of China or Greece or the Byzantine Empire, but it's not an important part of the, of the book just because I'm not an expert in that and I had these other things that I wanted to sort of draw out. I, I mean, am I responding to your, to your question? Yes, I mean, the book, of course, uh, uh, gives uh, different uh, shades and different uh, descriptions. So it starts with this hammer and anvil, uh, the, the iron beating Turks <laughs> and the origin myths and things like that. But also I found it very interesting about this notion of hypermobility of these, uh, hence nomadism in a way creates hypermobility, quick adjustability and also becoming minority rulers in majority um, yes. um, populations, which yes. create very interesting and paradoxical situations. Um, in your analysis, I think those come out really, really well. Well, there's a wonderful story there. I mean, my students, I guess it says more about the students than anything else. They're always astounded to hear that Turks don't originate in Turkey and that, you know, it's very, very far away. And there's this whole complex history of these movements westward and sort of southeastward until finally, you know, after quite a long time, um, there's arrival of Turkic waves of migration to Anatolia. And um, it's quite a revelation to the students. And when you explain to them that, uh, really, we're going back to the same part of Mongolia. We're talking about similar um, environmental and sort of underlying cultural origins to Turks and then to Mongols and probably these other peoples in between, like Xiongnu and so on. Then, I, I mean, it really captures their imaginations because they're, they're like, and then they come to understand, oh, there are Turkic people all over, everywhere. Um, and it allows me to make an important historical point, right? Which is that um, 
if the if the early life of the Turkic speaking peoples had really just been simple nomadism, there would never have been enough Turks to populate all of Central Asia the way they have. You have to, in order to do that, right? So just, and I have to explain to them about Carmen Cipolla and, you know, population density and economic base and so on. And, you know, for Turks to be able to do that, they have to actually have a very, very complex economic base. And this is part of this story, right? Of the constant interaction with the peripheral peoples. Um, and, um, you know, given with, you know, where your specialization is. These areas, Transoxiana, what we think of as Central Asia now is, is very, Transoxiana is really, I just taught this course not too long ago where the students use this book as the basis of it. They're all fascinated by Transoxiana and they've never heard of it before. And then once you explain to them and you, then you say, it's, it's critical to everything. Whether you're talking about Zoroastrianism, whether you're talking about the overland trade, it doesn't matter what it is, it's absolutely critical. But then they have to understand that, okay, actually the Turks have to arrive there, right? They, 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 don't, even, they don't even come from, from there. And then they begin to understand how complicated the story really is. And that, that is a fascinating thing. But as I say, I, in the, for me to tell the story I'm trying to st tell in the book, um, this has to be a role, right, that can sometimes be filled by other people, right? So Serbe or Tibetans or whatever, um, although the Turks are always kind of at the forefront of the thinking. Yes, thank you very much. Now, um, Michelle, we have some questions from uh, our uh, participants. You can also raise your hand and, and speak. You don't have to write your question. Yes, uh, Harun, please go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you very much for the organization. Um, and thank you very much for uh, the talk. Uh, my only question is, uh, um, um, what uh, what you are thinking about um, Hazanov's uh, um, ideas about the nomads and the outside world? Uh, I mean, the certain relation between nomadic uh, economic or social uh, uh, structures and uh, the the sedentary world. Um, this this pattern or incompatibility or the, the moment of crisis, um, you know, um, because of the, the deficit. Uh, and the second, uh, just a tiny question, if I may. Uh, Turks very often in the records uh, are, uh, if we can summarize it uh, by one word, they are the um, uh, 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 mercenaries. Uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, uh, if there is a role of uh, uh, so, uh, you, you, you mentioned the historical role or historical, uh, I don't know, yeah, role uh, of uh, the the Turks in the in the long durée, perhaps in millennium, I don't know, two millennia. Um, uh, if there are some nations can be representative of uh, elaborate uh, poetry, if some of them can be, you know, uh, representative of um, uh, philosophy or uh, pol political science. Uh, Turks very often appear as um, um, uh, mercenaries uh, from the Byzantine times to, you know, um, to Iranian. So it, we can refer to different, uh, to the Arabs as well. Um, so, what, what, what would you, is there is there anything you would like to comment on that point on that aspect? Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you. I I um, yes, uh, two things um, uh, on the on the point on Kazanov. Um, this I kind of talk about at the very beginning of the book, um, mostly because I want to get it out of the way, right? Because um, Kazanov, he's an anthropologist, and he's He's, and of course, he talks about history, and he's talking about this um, idea of uh, nomads, not only on the peripheries, but 
they um, also have a fairly low population density. And so inevitably over time, it looks like any political orders, independent political orders that would be constructed have to be kind of ephemeral because they're definitely going to be overwhelmed by um, these more populous uh, empires. And on the other hand, if the nomads should settle in one of these um, more populous societies, if they should settle there themselves, they will not be able to resist assimilation because of just the logistics of it all. And Hazamov's um, uh, Hasanov's um, model is is related to a kind of historical template we also have for talking about the history of so-called nomadic empires that um, they're short-lived uh, they they don't have much of an impact on the areas they rule because of whatever segregation between the ruler and the ruled or just the very small number of people who are there or this kind of focus on uh, what in the book I call the predatory enterprise, that uh, for some reason or other, these would be these um, ephemeral uh, entities that may have a certain historical impact in the sense of centralizing the, 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 uh, the um, uh, empires to which they are in opposition, right? So they can have this kind of, uh you know um indirect or oppositional effect but then they sort of disappear and um i'm not the first one to comment that uh this isn't the only thing you have to say about the impact of these uh nomadic empires whether they are long-lived or they are ephemeral in many cases you can see that they have affected very very long-lasting um cultural change and this is particularly true in in relation to religion so, uh, for instance, in Eastern Europe, um, you know, why would Eastern Europe not be Latinate in religious orientation? Why is it Bresciate, right, or have a sort of Byzantine orientation? Largely well, because of the Bulgars, really. Um, and why would Central Asia uh, be Islamic and, in fact, become Islamic in such a short time? It is largely because of these Turkic um, regimes. So, so there's many ways to understand the importance of Turkic empires as, I mean, of nomadic empires as nomadic empires. In the book, I'm not really very interested in nomadic empires. I'm interested in the rule over very populous agriculturally based societies by political regimes that have a nomadic origin. Um, and so I'm really, I'm far, far away from Kazanov's concerns. And so at the beginning of the book, I try, just try to explain, well, he uses the word nomad and I'm using the word nomad, but he's actually talking about something else, something very different from what I'm talking about. And I agree with everything he said about what he's talking about. He might agree with everything I'm saying about what I'm talking about, but we're just talking about two different things. Um, mercenaries, yes, I was very interested in the subject mercenaries, particularly in relation to the so-called confessional age, right? So the confessional age, this was, you know, Marshall Hodgson had this idea. Um, he thought it didn't apply to some areas of Eurasia that I think it probably does apply to. Um, the point about, one of the points about the confessional age is the way in which it promoted, uh, because of the past of the patterns of these religious conquests that it uh, promoted um, the um, recruitment and the um, institutionalization of mercenaries, of uh, mercenary populations. So I do talk a lot about the Turks having this role in the um, Islamic uh, world, particularly the Kipchats who went like literally everywhere. But um, I also compare it to the Varangians and the, and the uh, Normans um, in Europe, who I think have a very similar kind of history in relation to the same sort of dynamics of the confessional age. So uh, in the mercenaries, yeah, there's a, um, you know, there, I, I did read about um, uh, this whole um, literary history of uh, biography in the Islamic world um, in relation to uh, Turkic families and Turkic individuals who started out as mercenaries but then became, you know, they're Ghazi. And because they're Ghazi, they clearly 
there's another dimension to that. They, they are actually believers. They, they become sort of important pillars of orthodoxy and so on. So that in, in the biographies, you, you could see um, this, is, this is of the you know, um, very late Abbasid period and all the way through Selkirk. You could, you could see this, the emphasis on this transformation that, well, okay, at first they're having a kind of mercenary role, but then, you know, they, they're actually, because they are true beliefs, they actually go on to become um, pillars of orthodoxy. And so there's this, there, there this very size to it. But mercenaries is, you know, somebody should just do a book on medieval mercenaries. It would be a really great. That was good. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions from the floor? Sorry, I can't see if you have your hand up. Guide. Well, as I always say to me. It's okay, yes, I, you go ahead. Found somebody. No, as I just said, uh, with my students, you know, we often have these kind of impasses. And um, I always have to explain to them that I was educated by the Quakers. And so we just sit there till somebody is going to witness. Uh, so it's fine. With me. <laughs> well, there is so much to talk about. Um, uh, perhaps uh, you could actually, because you, towards the end, you make comparisons between Qing and the Romanos and the interactions. Uh, and also, you know, this point about centralization basically eliminating aristocracies for it. It goes back to Machiavelli uh, issues again. Uh, sure. kind of inspiration from the Ottoman uh, governance that not allowing aristocracy become powerful, having, an, uh, uh, having a, a professional um, army and this celestial approach to rulership. Could you a little bit elaborate on that uh, for our uh, audience? Yeah, that is pretty important. The, the book um, breaks off, or I try to break it off, before I'm able to say anything very extensive about um, Romanov or Qing. But they do they do get in there because there's a there is this continuation of particularly this trend of objectification of identity. That in fact that's a subsequent book that I'm doing. That that, that actually it gets much worse in the 18th century, uh, or it gets more intense in the 18th century. And then in the 19th century, um, undergoes this sort of transformation, becoming the basis of national and ethnic identities. <clears throat> so um, uh, the Machiavelli sort of angle there is very good. This is what he liked about the Ottomans, that number one, they understand that you can't let the aristocracy get out of hand. He thought this is where the Europeans had gone wrong, um, but that the Ottomans had understood about this. Um, and the whole idea of the professional military, again, and having a distinct military identity, uh, he thought this was a necessary part of the imperial enterprise. And that, again, the Ottomans were, were sort of getting this and others were not sort of catching on to that. Um, the, on the, um, the, this, this uh, well, there's, there's two sort of uh, sides to this in each case. There's the continuation of what I think is uh, the resonance of the impact of Mongol rule in these cases, not, not in the case of the Ottomans, but we're talking about Romanovs now in, in Qing. Um, and in some ways, the transitional role played by Muscovy is, is a lot like the transitional role played by Ming, in the sense that in each case, you have the development of a historical ideology that is terrifically hostile to Mongols and the Mongol period, but on the other hand, is preserving many of the institutions. And particularly these institutions of objectification of identity. And the second thing, which is a kind of a 
sort of hidden theme until you get to the very end of the book is this idea, these very small states that um, this, you know, the Song um, Empire in China had a you know, fairly large, well-funded, very professionalized, centralized state. Um, when Yuan came in, the Mongols, they changed a great deal of this. And strangely, when Ming came in after the Mongols, they didn't change it back. Right. So they restored the government offices, they, they um, reestablished the examination system and so on. But in terms of the scale of the state in relation to society, um, it's, it's bigger than Yuan, but it's, it's not on the scale with Song. And they keep the smaller state and Qing follows right along with that. I mean, almost uh, the civil state remains almost exactly the same size it had been in the Ming. Um, this is similar to what's happening with Romanov, which also, uh, like the Muscovy state, is a very small state in relation to society. Um, and of course, the Ottomans actually are following on the same sort of line. There's a lot of, this makes a lot of sense in the late medieval and even early modern world, in that you have a low overhead. Uh, the farmers are happy and productive, not being crushed by heavy tax burdens. Um, uh, you don't have to put down a, a whole lot of rebellions and, you know, about, about, about taxes. The state remains of a size where it's kind of easy to surveil. Um, but the problem is when they encounter what happens in the next book after this one, what happens when they encounter these other societies that have been built in huge states, uh, partly on the basis of deficit financing. And then these small states that are the inheritors of this grand uh, continental overland conquest tradition um, are there with their very small states and unable to, unable to respond to some of the um, the dangers right, uh, presented by these these uh, aggress. So it, to me, this is one of the things always kind of missing. In this history of imperialism that people want to tell you about how imperialism comes and they've got all their weapons, they've got their guns, they've got a lot of money. And they... But why do they? It's because in the 19th century in particular, they have, these states have become very large um, in relation to the traditional states of the of overland continent. Um, and so I think that disparity, as I, I think I say this right at the beginning of the book, that these are the developments that the, that the that the, uh, what do I say? That the tradition of Turkic rulership over these societies actually leads to the destruction of these empires themselves. Such an important theme in what they were doing. And I don't think that that's a particular feature that Machiavelli would have approved of. Um, I think he probably would have said, no, if states should get real big, you know, uh, then you'll be able to deal with all these problems. I guess that's why we had East India Company. You know, you don't have to rule by by the center. You can give it to the companies, and they can create their own uh, mini statehoods, uh, which goes back to the modern day uh, multinational enterprises. Uh, uh, <laughs> and well, they. they that's right. I mean, the charter companies actually come slightly before this this sort of this grand state enlargement I'm speaking of. But it is interesting. The charter companies, of course, before you have the East India Company, uh, 50 years before anyway, there's there's the so-called Turkey Company, right, that has, has gone to Ottoman. And there's the Russia Company, right, that has gone to Moscow. And it really is within the world that's being delineated in the book more or less where these because that's where they go to where the wealth is um and so the wealth is in these large uh agriculturally based societies that have had this post nomadic rule um for centuries um and then it's it's after that's kind of quasi public uh private combination but gets superseded by this, these large formal, so eventually, you know, in India, BEIC has to, it gives way to the Raj, right? Um, this is an actual direct imposition of state. Um, and um, that was the struggle in China 
uh, a difficult and complex one uh, to try to get around the BEIC and establish direct state-to-state -state communication. Yes, thank you. Um, great. <laughs> These are all great topics. <laughs> uh, other yeah. questions or comments? I think Harun, Harun is rising, raising his hands, Harun. Harun? Uh, yes, uh, sorry for for another, for, an, for a, a second round, if I may. Uh, it is, I think it I is forgot to welcome. switch off my, uh, I think I sw forgot to switch off my, thank you, uh, switch off my voice. Uh, um uh, if i didn't uh, switch uh, to the mute so if i uh, unintentionally may cause the technical issue while you were speaking i may i apologize for that uh, um, um so my my oh, no. question my my uh, actually question I'm, what i'm curious about uh, based on uh, uh, what you shared with us so far. Unfortunately, I haven't uh, read uh, your book yet. Uh, that's very unfortunate, of course. Uh, um, um, uh, this, uh, mm, uh, the Oriental uh, despotism, uh, which we might uh, summarize as, um, uh, hello? Yes. Uh, um, so um, it has been a discussion, you know, uh, all the way from 1920s and 30s with uh, wheat fogel and um, uh, control of irrigation systems, and then um, and the, the Eurasianist uh, uh, approach to to history um, in in the interwar period. Um, um, and, and later on, all these discussions, uh, that, like the lack of aristocracy, centralized uh, uh, bureaucracy, um, uh, topped by, uh, led by uh, a powerful monarch, um, which which was uh, which was very uh, un, uh, which was uh, which was not seen in Europe in that sense. Uh, uh, I mean, what what uh, Russia, uh, China. Um, or uh, Iranian plateau experience for uh, centuries. Um, so, um, so, and the, and the, and the approach was uh, in one sentence like uh, this was this was mainly came from China and it traveled on a saddle of a Mongolian warrior. It ended up in Moscow. It ended up in uh, 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 in other parts of uh, Eurasian territories. That's why. Um, uh, there is no uh, uh, atomization of political power, economic uh, uh, production, you know, the, the means of production. They were all uh, centralized, uh, and it all came uh, originated from China, and it spread. Uh, um, the Mongols were actually conveyors of it. They were not. They were copy pasting what they learned from the Chinese bureaucracy and Chinese administration, like uh, counting people. Uh, uh, you know. Um, uh, uh, strict uh, regulations, um, uh, taxation, uh, and so forth and so forth. So um, now what I, uh, uh, so far what I understood, um, uh, what I heard uh, um, from your perspective is, um, no, this was not uh, uh, that simple. The, 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 the nomadic world uh, played also an important role. Actually, the nomadic world, because of their elasticity, uh, um, um, flexibility, they, in a way, at, in some cases, limited that uh, omnipresent state structure. Uh, they uh, they, they uh, all kind of sometimes even optimized it uh, and, uh, and prevented excessive, uh, expensive, uh, or this natural tendency of bureaucracy, uh, like you know, back, co back colonial of bacteria uh, uh, expanding. You know, bureaucracy has this global tendency. You know, this <laughs> expanding, it's regenerating itself. So uh, these nomadic traditions, the elasticity uh, uh, of it uh, limited these uh, tendencies and reformed the original Chinese. Uh, um, uh, um, this source, uh, let's say, uh, it, am, I, am I am I right to understand it? Uh, 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 thank you very much. Uh, in this way. Thank you. 
Now, let me go back a little bit in your question. But you mentioned Wittfogel. Yes. So this, this narrative, I don't remember this very well, but this narrative of this um, despotism, right, originating in China and then getting transmitted uh, westward by the Mongols, is that is, is that Wittfogel's? I, I just don't, is, is it? I, I'm just asking, I don't remember that. It, it's 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 uh, it's uh, it was as far as I remember. Um, perhaps some other uh, from the audience might correct me because I, I I read it very long time ago. It was nineteen um, twenties okay. thirties. Uh, there was this uh, uh, discussion of this or, uh, origin of uh, uh, Asiatic means of production in uh, Marxist terminology and right. Oriental despotism. And what what are the reasons right. of this difference between uh, feudalism, uh, aristocracy in Western Europe? Uh, is this a, a kind of a mutation? Is this a, a small uh, uh, derailed? You know, is this the main course of uh, Marxist, or is this the main course of history? What we saw in uh, a feudal Europe or uh, the European? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, Euro-Asian, uh, uh, actually Asian, uh, um, uh, Oriental despot and um, uh, bureaucratic pyramid. Uh, uh, is is that the uh, main course of history? Uh, and we are are we too Eurocentric? They are all uh, discussed among the Eurasianists uh, in the 1920s, 30s, uh, as far as I remember. And um, yeah. Uh, and then the Wittfogel aspect is, I think, this is, whole thing is goes back to also um, control of means of production, but in 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 which sense? In the in terms of controlling uh, main rivers and building irrigation systems and controlling those irrigation systems uh, by this uh, um, omnipotent um, uh, ruler and it's uh, the bureaucracy that had to be uh, uh, developed around that irrigation system uh, as it happened in China, as it happened in uh, Mesopotamia or in ancient Egypt. So I think Wittfogel later on expanded this theory in that sense. So, uh, but the, 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 um, the ideal example was uh, considered an, a long and uninterrupted example. And in terms of scale as well, uh, unmatched unmatched example was China. Um, yes. So, uh, yes. so the, um, the, of course, the discussion goes on to Russian case because how far irrigation system control of the construction of irrigation systems uh, was involved in the Russian case because which 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 was not the case obviously there weren't any irrigation systems in Kievian uh, post Kievian post you know Kievian Rus the Mongol period and and further down the road in the. Um, uh, so um, yeah, uh, it, it's yes. Sorry, sorry for sorry for the long. Uh, oh no, 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 it's quite okay. I, I I'm actually well. I'm very interested in this for an, another reason entirely, which was um, not too long ago. I published an article called "China Normal," which was um, a lot of it dealing with exactly exactly these issues. Yeah, this, this Oriental despotism, you know, it does come out of uh, Marx and Engels' um, Asiatic production. And it, Marx didn't have that much to do with it. Engels was kind of developing this after after Marx had, had died. And um, yeah, it, early societies prodigiously centralizing um, and uh, getting themselves into a predicament because of this uh, development of, of oversized um, civil states getting themselves into a, a predicament where they can't be affected by the contradictions um, of history and actually move through the status, right? Um, and yes, China, is really from Engels all the way to, to Wittfogel, um, China is seen as the continuing example. Mesopotamia and Egypt are gone. Um, India, which, which had been sort of important in these discussions, has been colonized by the British, so it's also sort of on itself it's back on a historical track and then china was seen as this persisting um, um example and it is possible uh, this sounds a bit familiar to me maybe it was Vic Fogel who thought that this uh chinese despotic tradition had somehow been the, the mongols had brought it uh, westward um but of course i mean the, 
in the book, I'm telling a completely different sort of story, which is a, first of all, it's, it's not really about despotism. I have a chapter on sultans in which I sort of put them in the context of these uh, political, these Turkic political traditions of the qualified, very qualified power on the part of the the man who's at the top of the hierarchy and various kinds of institutions that are mitigating um, the the kind of um, discretion, right? The leverage of this individual and the, in the case of the sultans, you know, I, where I'm seeing this, these traditions brought into the Islamic world and then sort of confronting and being transformed by, but also transforming uh, some of the um, institutions of rule in the in the Islamic world. So then the Europeans like Montaigne and Montespi are referring to Oriental despotism. They are mostly thinking about Persia and uh, the Ottomans to a certain extent. Um, in the 18th century, they begin to get fixed on China. But in the 17th century, they, they're really focused on this um, sort of um, Islamic world where they think that um, this despotism, everybody is, is completely without uh, any kind of legal protections uh, uh, or property protections and they all live in constant fear of the, of the despot and so on. Um, I didn't find any political system that was actually like that. Um, and um, in fact, this goes back again to the Machiavelli question of what is the role of the aristocracy? Are they playing a mitigating role or have they been neutralized and so on, which is a little bit what happened in the Qing. Um, the, you just, uh, it's just hard to find that. And I mean, for Marx and Engels, this was a, a necessity. They had to show that if you get off of the European pattern of development, there's something pathological about that. You'll get trapped, right, in this kind of impossible, uh, you become ahistorical. You, you just will, will be in this um, space where the large forces of history can never really um, cause any transformational changes until the imperialists come along and just, just kind of um, knock you down and then suddenly you see things differently. They had to have that, right? So they, I mean, I think they had to have this foil. Um, uh, Montesquieu and Montaigne needed it because they were trying to critique despotic trends in European politics. And the best way that they thought to do that was to claim, well, the, there's those things out there, the Oriental despots, and you know, you're kind of becoming like them. You're trying to reduce us to the status of all these Orientals who are actually just slaves in their own society. You're trying to do that to us. They didn't have rhetorically, right? They just didn't have another way to do that. So, um, so you have Marx's very, and, and particularly Engels, very powerful theoretical um, compulsion to uh, explain uh, non-European developmental patterns as pathological. And then you have these strong um, rhetorical compulsions in early modern Europe because of their own political transformations and anxieties and creating this other image of um, um, Oriental despotism. So all, what I can say in relation to my book, apart from what I said about Machiavelli, which I think is, a, is really interesting in light of this discussion, is that I just didn't find that story at all, right? Um, the Mongols actually imposed on China certain kinds of institutions that really didn't go away. It's not only the state size, but these other institutions that contribute to objectification of identities within the society and making that a very important part of what the state does and what the legal system does. Um, that's the Mongols sort of were dropping this everywhere, but a lot of this ground had already been laid by earlier Turkic rule over some of these societies. Um, and so it's not, I don't find it to be uh, despotism. It's not democracy, but Europe doesn't have democracy until a fairly late period either. So uh, yeah, so Wittfogel and uh, Wittfogel is just a, to me an interesting object of study, right? As something that happened in intellectual history among, I mean, he was a European who was transplanted to America. So let's say among Europeans who are transplanted to America um, and, and not really a way of looking at the history as, as I would 
understand it and as I'm trying to sort of suggest it in, in the book. Fantastic. I think that's a great uh, end because the book is really illustrating that these ideological or theoretical niceties uh, and usage co for convenience fail us. We have to look at things deeper and um, in a more um, interrelated manner. So I recommend that we are uh, basically done with time. Um, I recommend all of you and other uh, listeners to read the book. And I'm delighted to hear that it's going to be translated into Turkish. I will definitely recommend to my parents and relatives to, uh, to read it. Uh, thank you, Professor well, Crossley. I hope they like it. Uh, yes. I, I'm pretty sure they will, because we all claim that we know history, we know our history, but I, if, I'm just honest to say that we actually don't. <laughs> uh, like all of us. Yeah. And history is written always uh, anew, so there's always something to learn about. Uh, so that's, that's I guess, uh, uh, a brief end to the session and uh, this, this has been great thank you very much for uh, for joining us and uh, we are uh, really pleased to have you with us uh, thank you very much thank you so much for arranging this thank you it's lovely to meet you and i'm so happy to see your group and uh, i will follow you on youtube uh, this is great work that you're doing <laughs>